quick answer. What is it you like about your favorite teacher, your favorite professor? What is it you liked about him or her? It was his passion, her passion. What you liked about that professor was she was into it, right? Just was excited about English literature or, or the history of banking or chemistry or whatever it is. What got you excited about it was the teacher was excited. So I say to any teacher, science teachers especially, let your passion come through. And when you blow something up, have fun. And I, to everybody who teaches anything but science, I'm sorry for you, man. <laughs> in science class, we blow stuff up. And it's cool. My name is Alex Dos Santos, and I am a grade 6 STEM teacher, which means that I am responsible for teaching all of the grade 6 Massachusetts science standards to my scholars. And I teach STEM, which stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics, which is new to a lot of my students. And one thing that they've really picked up on this year is how math and science are so interconnected. We cannot really have one without the other. And that's something that I'm always trying to build into my practice. So my objectives for the lesson that I'm going to describe to you um, can be found on the board. So here is the content objective, here is a science standard, and here are the science practices. So a content objective is that my hardworking scientists will be able to design an experiment through developing a hypothesis, data table, and procedure to conclude where to build a bread factory. Um, the science standard is 6MSLS1, which calls for them to conduct an investigation that provides evidence that living things are made of cells. That's really just the basics, right? For them to understand that living things are made of cells, living things do not come from non-living things. So that builds upon the work that they do in grades um, K to 5. And the standards that will be addressed here, sorry, not the standards, but the practices, um, were number one, asking questions. The question is, where should I build my bread factory? Um, they will be developing and using models as they go on a worksheet that will be provided, that will be here in the PowerPoint as well. They have to plan and carry out their own investigation through this task. Um, they will then need to analyze and interpret their data and construct explanations. So please pass the bread. They, or you, are deciding a location for a new natural bread factory. One location is dry, the picture that is higher, and the other is very humid, the picture that is lower. The bread will not have any preservatives, so they will need to determine which location will be best so that their bread can last longer. So that's where I try to bring in um, just real, real life applications, right? Something that they can take from my sixth grade classroom and apply it to the business world, science, whatever it may be. After I go over the story, develop a hypothesis which will state which location is the better location. And then the challenge will be for them and their group to design an experimental setup to test said hypothesis. So it's not just, I would like to work in the humid climate because it's by the water, I would like to go to the beach, or I would like to work in the dry climate because I like my bread to be dry and not soggy. I mean, they need to really be able to back up why they're going to set location. So this here is a copy of on the first page of the worksheet. So the worksheet here um, just has a title, please pass the bread, and then we walk through um, what it is that scholars need to do. So here are the materials that will be provided to them. Here is their inquiry focus. Here is the question, what factors are necessary for bread molds to grow? And then just step by step. So again, here we go over the, um, the context of the problem, right? The, the bread factory. And here they have to develop a hypothesis. Will bread molds grow faster under wet or dry conditions? They will need to then explain. Following the explanation with the partner, they need to design an experimental setup to test that hypothesis, and they should plan on using the materials that you know, I have provided, um, but if there are other materials around the room, I'm always encouraging that creativity, that problem-solving mechanism, you know, how can I reach my goal? And then um, step four tells them, ask them to write a detailed procedure that describes how they will use that setup to test their hypothesis, and as they write their procedure, they should keep a few things in mind. Bread will take about five days um, for molds to have grown on it. 
So it'll take five days to see that mold. So if it's four days and they're not seeing any molds, right, they're not out of the water yet, right, there's still time. Um, mold grows best in a warm, dark place. That is helpful information. And they will need to keep the moisture levels of the bread constant throughout the entire experiment. On the second page, um, it asks them to create a data table below to record data and observations as they perform their experiment. And I have to check their setup. I have to check their procedure, their detailed procedure here, and the data table um, before they begin their experiment. So that way they're planning, going through the whole planning process and not jumping into something that you know would lead them to failure at the end for whatever reason. Even though failure is good, right? I do believe that mistakes allow thinking to happen. You need to fail to learn, but um, in, I do want them to have success with this lab as well. So following the, um, the entire investigation, then there's an analysis and conclusion page. So this is where I want to bring them back to, yes, scientists are doing things hands-on, working, testing things, collaborating, but they also need to grab that pen and paper and get right to work. Or obviously, um, as you know, teachers, we understand that scholars also have accommodations, so they could potentially type this out. So a few questions here, right? Asking them what the manipulated variable was in the experiment and why it was necessary to control all other variables. So trying to bring in um, just the fundamentals of science, right? Variables, like why do we do the things that we do as scientists? And then observing, right? So how did the appearance of the two slices of bread change over the course of the experiment? So taking their observation of sight and then writing down what they see. Um, then they need to be able to draw conclusions. So they, they should see differences in their two pieces of bread. How can we explain those differences? Why? Please give me claim evidence, reasoning, and then to infer, right, where did the mold on the bread come from? Should have came from somewhere. We know that all living things come from other living things. All living things are made of cells, so I would be looking for some information there. Then there is more space for them to speak, right, so talking more about potential variables, so variables that they could have used. Um, thinking about any sources of errors in their experiments and how they can then improve upon that. And then I'm um, posing some questions. We always want to have, in my belief, right, we always want to have some questions after um, our experiment is done. Learning should never end. There's always a next step. There are always prior, aven prior avenues. There are always um, other avenues, additional avenues to go on. And here at the end, I gave just a little extra. Right? So suppose that you lived in biologist Francesco Reddy's time. A friend, a friend tells you that she thinks that molds just suddenly appear on bread. How would you explain to your friend about Reddy's experiment and how it applies to mold and bread? Um, some background on this is before this investigation took place, we spoke about Francesco Reddy, who was, um, he was a scientist and he was the one who discovered the conditions necessary for um, living things to arise. Right? I believe Reddy was the one who took two jars with a piece of meat in each jar, and he left one jar uncovered, and the other jar was covered. And after a few days, um, he saw that maggots right, arose from the pieces of meat that was left uncovered, but not the piece of meat that was covered. So that then led him to determine that there was a reason for those maggots, those living things, to arise. And that's essentially, or that is a real life connection, the historical connection that really gives us um, the starting point for what we're doing in our investigation. Um, so here I just gave another table for the science practices and just how exactly they will be applied. I made this table by going into PowerPoint and um, there was a tab that said design and I clicked design and it had a whole bunch of options so I thought it was a good visual way to show the practices. So they would start with asking questions. What factors are necessary for bread molds to grow? Even though I pose that question to them, they need to take that question and make it their own. Um, then they will develop and use models, so they should create a data table to record data and observations as they perform their experiment. I would expect and encourage um, creative right, data table ideas. T-charts, whatever type of table you want to make, just explain to me why that's applicable. Then they should plan and carry out their investigation, so that's where they set up their procedure and then test their hypothesis. They should then analyze and interpret their data following their data collection from their table. And finally, construct an explanation. Explain your work, explain your findings to the class. And that is all, folks. Wow. Four seconds to spend. <laughs>